Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Carrie Conran's film Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow. Now, this is probably the quintessential diesel punk film. Um, so this is the uh, Sky Captain is what's called a Tensian uh, diesel punk, which is pre World War II. So we've got it's set in the 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 30s um early 30s we've got elements of sort of nazi style iconography but it's pre third reich um this is a film that combines elements of film noir combines elements of world war ii uh fighter plane uh movies uh <clears throat> it combines elements of mystery it's an action adventure story but the thing that's really interesting to me about the film is the way that technology figures as both a fascination and a source of horror so it if you're unfamiliar with diesel punk as a genre, basically this is advanced machinery, uh, advanced technology and weapons set in basically World War I up through about 1950. So that's the broad genre style. So it's, it's like steampunk, but early mid 20th century. So uh, much more of a World War One, World War Two, or gangster film noir type aesthetic, but still with advanced machinery running on running more on diesel power or early nuclear energy things like that, rather than steampunk with its Victorian nineteenth century Wild West steam driven aesthetics. So it's the same kind of thing. Um, and so because this is a genre that's really about like tanks, land ships, uh, airplanes, uh, flying fortresses, things like this, it, technology is really central and it is in Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow as well. So basically, a uh, quick sort of plot summary, basically what happens is, um, your two main characters are Sky Captain uh, and Polly Perkins. Sky Captain is a mercenary pilot, leader of the Flying Legion, who are these sort of world protectors, defeating um, mad scientists, rogue military people, etc., etc. Uh, Polly Perkins is a reporter, um, the sort of gritty do anything to get a story type reporter that you you get in film noir type type uh movies so you got these two characters they have a troubled history but when a group of mechanical uh, giant giant flying mechanical robots attack uh new york city Polly Perkins is there to report on it, and Sky Captain defeats them in his in his uh, P-50 Warhawk. I think is is his plane, uh, very heavily modified. Um, so Polly ends up. Polly has been contacted by a scientist uh, because she's been reporting on a set of uh, a set of missing scientists, people scientists who go missing. Um, who all have connections to this group of World War I German scientists known as Unit 11. Very mysterious. Uh, so she's contacted by the last remaining scientist who hasn't gone missing, who gives her a tip, the name Totenkopf. Polly follows this up, but she also gets um, some blueprints from this guy she takes them to sky captain uh, in his secret 
mountain, island, fortress, whatever it is. Uh, while she's there, the secret base gets attacked by Totenkopf's forces. So Sky Captain has to, again, fight them off. Um, and then Sky Cap basically Sky Captain and Polly make a deal where she will get exclusive reporting rights um, and he will get the information that she has leading, hopefully, to Totenkopf. So they go on basically this series of adventures where they sort of chasing Totenkopf across the globe. Um, they end up in Nepal. Um, oh, yeah. Um, um, when uh, Totenkopf's forces attack Sky Captain's base, they kidnap his sort of chief engineer slash design genius named Dex. Uh, so they're also going to get Dex back. Uh, so they go to Nepal, chase him down, and basically they're like investigating and they're finding these sort of horrific um, remnants of where Totenkopf has done like uranium mining and things like this with enslaved locals and stuff. Um, so eventually they make it to Totenkopf's secret island. Um, again, having to sort of periodically fight off his mechanized forces um and there they discover totenkov's actual plan which is he builds this gigantic rocket that's going to be an arc basically um they're going to get two of every animal so again noah's ark style put them on this thing he's going to blast this rocket off into space to a different planet and uh basically start again uh, because Totenkopf believes that humanity has fucked up Earth, and so he needs to rebuild it. Also, as a byproduct of him doing that, he's going to incinerate the planet. He's going to incinerate Earth. So, Sky Captain, Polly, and now Dex, who they've sort of reunited with, because Dex was just sort of wandering freely through this um, secret evil villain's base they start figuring out how to stop this rocket from going off. And what they find when they get into Totenkopf's office is that Totenkopf is no more. He is an ex-supervillain. Uh, he has... He has... Um, I forget... Uh, I was trying to go further with the Monty Python parrot sketch, but I forget exactly what it is. Uh, anyway... Totenkopf is dead, and he's been dead for about 20 years, and the machines that he built have kept going. Like, they've kept on with their mission of, we have to build an arc, send it into space, incinerator. So, Sky Captain and Polly have to stop them now. The, and the only way to do that is to get onto the rocket itself and stop the incinerate Earth mechanism. So they have to do, and they have to fight Again, more robots, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and one of the one of the figures in particular that they have to fight periodically throughout the film is the sort of nameless Asian android played by Bai Ling, um, and and she like they don't know that she's an android initially. She's just incredibly strong and flexible and basically kicks sky captain's ass several times but then when polly perkins bashes her in the face with a, a pipe or something like that and half of her face comes off and it's all mechanized and stuff they're like oh yeah she's an android so that leads me into one of the really interesting things about this film is there's a kind of uncanny aspect to this so the uncanny is an idea um, in in literary studies and film and television studies. We really get this from Freud. Um, the idea is basically it's something that's recognizable, but is slightly off, and it's slightly off enough that it's unsettling. So um, we tend to think about the uncanny with things like zombie movies or uh, vampire movies. Something that's human 
ish, but that ish is where the sort of existential dread comes from. So zombie, right, is is human, but not human. It's an ex-human. Um, the same thing with a vampire. Like, there's enough difference there from what we would recognize as a human that it's unsettling. For as much as Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow and Diesel Punk in general embraces and loves technology, there's also an uncanny element here. Particular, because if you think about, like, the, the giant robots, for instance, that attack New York in the beginning of the film, they are just sort of marching, they're mindless, but they're human-shaped. So there's something humanish about them. And then later we have these much more sort of tentacly armed robots that attack the base and that kidnap Dex. Again, there's something human, but not clearly not human about them. So they're on that sort of weird borderline. But once we learn that Totenkopf is dead and that the the robots have continued their mechanized tasks without him. Again, we have that sort of uncanny creepiness of the undead, of, of something that should have ceased to function, but is continuing mechanically to sort of drag itself forward. Like, Totenkopf lives beyond his death because these machines carry on his work and they carry it on mindlessly like they there's no thought or intentionality in and of themselves they simply do what they're programmed to do and there is this zombie like component to it and and the android played by Bai Ling is probably the greatest example of the uncanny here because again, the first several times that she and Sky Captain face off, we don't know that she's an android. She looks enough and moves enough like a human being, an exceptionally skilled and strong human being, but she looks and, and moves enough like a human being that we don't know that she's an android. And so later on, when we get, when we find out that she's a robot, Again, we have that sense of the uncanny, that sense of unease. This is something, this is someone that we that we have thought was human, who we're now finding out isn't. And there's that shift between the human and the not quite human that's really, again, quite unsettling. And and it builds into this, I, this sort of film noir idea, uh, or this film noir feeling because film noir really runs on an economy of unease so we get that in um in, in the sort of zombified robots of, of totenkov the other thing that's really striking to me about this film and it, its fascination with technology or machinery or robotics is that Totenkopf has Totenkopf, who's a mechanical genius builds these amazing machines like machines that are even ahead of technology today in 2021 but Totenkopf also realizes machines are insufficient and this is why we get the arc this is why we get the idea that he needs to build a rocket and take animals into space and and genetic profiles of people um genetically enhanced people and that's the thing like that's i guess another component of the uncanny is there are these two test tubes that totenkopf needs before he can send the rocket into space and they contain the genetic profiles of perfect people so again we get that eugenics component we get that sort of proto-Nazi, master race, ubermensch kind of idea. Um, so, not good stuff. Totenkopf's 
bad guy. But it's it's really interesting that his idea for building a new perfect world relies on nature, relies on the natural world, on animals, which highlights sort of the limits of mechanization, the limits of the possibilities of technology and discovery and mechanical genius even. Like, Totenkopf is, is simply not able to replace nature and that's really an interesting statement sort of problematizing the love of machinery in dieselpunk 